you for the honor of being part. My father told a story about um, oh, Malamed, a Rav in the times of the Temach Tzedek, who came to the Temach Tzedek with a, a very, he was very frustrated. There was a person in his community who would always, any any time he was giving a shear or uh, trying to get everybody inspired about something, there was this one person, a kaifer, a, but a very learned kaifer, who would stand up and argue and bring this proof and that proof. And it was because he was so learned, he came across as very, um, he, he really was able to disturb and he caused so many people to have doubts. And this the Rav was very, very frustrated by this kaifer, even though he was always able to answer him, but still it was very, very, it was just very draining. So once when the Rav came to the Tzemach Tzedek, when the, yeah, he came to the Tzemach Tzedek and he said, what should I do? The Tzemach Tzedek said, bring him to me. He brought the, this man, he invited him. I don't know how he got him to come, this Kaifer, to visit the Tzemach Tzedek. Maybe he thought he's also going to, you know, impact the Tzemach Tzedek. And the Tzemach Tzedek saw him and he gave him a slap across his face. He said, <laughs> um, when he was born, he said, every time, you know, an neshama before it's born is, learns while it's in his mother's womb, the neshama learns the entire Torah. And then just before that moment of birth, a malach comes and patches the baby. And with that, in that instant, the baby forgets all the Torah that he learned and enters the world with a fresh, clean slate. The Samach Tzedek said, you, the malach, never patched. And therefore, you always knew the entire Torah, and now you're going to forget it. And um, and he did. This man did forget it. And the Tzemach Tzedek explained that why did he? Why was he such a kaifer? It was because he never had the opportunity because he knew everything that there was to know. He never forgot anything from before he was born, because he knew everything that was needed to know. He never needed to learn from a malamid. And therefore, he never had Yerah Shemai. My father used to tell us the story and say, from here we see that a Malamid, in addition to teaching everything, a Malamid's main job is to give a child Yerah Shemayim, which is such an, it's, it's, in, it's the foundation of everything, the roots of everything else. Anyways, that was just a, an introduction. I'm really, really honored to be speaking to fellow Machan Chais. Each of you is so, so treasured. The Rebbe looked at, at Mechanchais as a separate category. You know, there's, a, there's people who have jobs and then there's Mechanchais and Mechanchim, who the Rebbe looked at as a separate category, a unique shlichus. Um, and, it, and it's really an honor, humbling privilege to be part of this event tonight. So let's jump right in. Each of us teaches different subjects, different age groups, different ideas at different times of the day. But there's one thing we all have in common. And it's almost like our different subjects are like different branches of the tree. But then there's the foundation of the tree. There's the roots and the trunk where everything comes together. And definitely as the Rebbe's Hasidim, the roots and the foundation of everything that we want to teach the children is a perspective about life and a purpose to life, and a mission, a direction of where we're going, and that is about Geula. And of course, that, that's the, the, that, that comes with teaching children about Hashem, and Yerushalayim, and making true Yerushalayim, and true connection with Hashem, a central part of every single minute, of every single day, every single educational experience. And while I was thinking about this today, it hit me that, you know, uh, a branch of a tree, when it's connected to a tree, it's a symbol of life. It, it grows, it's alive. It, every season, it sprouts new leaves. And if it's a fruit tree, it, it sprouts new fruits. And it's a very beautiful, living, organic, healthy entity. But when you take that tree and you cut, when you take that same branch and you cut it off from the tree, once it's disconnected from the tree, it's not a living thing at all. It's a stick. It cracks, it breaks, it splinters. It can easily burn. The more disconnected it is, the more dry it is, and the more easily it can burn. And really, I feel that this is the same thing with the things that we teach and the ideas and all the subject matter that we're giving over to the children. If we teach children um, concepts, all the information, 
but there's a disconnect from the foundation, from the roots, from the trunk of the tree. It's like giving them branches instead of a living organic etzachayim. What we want to do is always bring things back to the connection, to the source, to the roots, so that our teachings are alive, vibrant, filled with energy and life-giving strength that children need in order to live. Because a stick is worthless when it comes to, you know, when it comes to real life. It's, it, doesn't give us, it doesn't give us anything. We really need to be attached to the tree in order to thrive. So that's the importance of really connecting everything that we learn to the foundation, which for us as Hasidim, it's a perspective, it's a worldview, it's it's a, a perspective of Mashiach and Geula. I'm sorry if there's a background noise. Do you hear it? Or it's just me. There's noise outside my window. I apologize. It's okay. We hear you very well. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what does it look like when we're connected to the foundation? What does that look like? And I think the most practical thing about that is that we talk about it a lot. When you're excited about something, when you're interested in something, when something is important, we talk about it a lot. Geula has to be part of every single subject, every single day. Now, maybe in, certain sense, in a certain sense, that's not possible. For sure, it's possible every single day for, for those of you who teach a full day. Um, for sure, it's possible within every unit. If we're teaching about the Yom Tiv of Pesach, then there is, let's say, 12 lessons in which you teach Pesach. One of them has to be dedicated to the, cons to the connection between Pesach and the bigger picture of Geula. We always want to take every subject, Shabbos, Halacha, Kashras, whatever it is, Parsha Navi, always has to be at least one lesson or at least a few minutes of the lesson, if there is only one lesson, where you connect it to the bigger picture so that you are not, the, the tree is not just, um, it's not just a branch. It's, it's, it's not just a stick. It's a branch, part of a big tree. It's connected to, to the bigger picture. So that's one thing. Um, that's the first thing and the most important thing. And as we're talking about that, I just wanna go off a little bit on a tangent and talk about what is Geula? What are we, what are we trying to speak about? What, are we, what is the bigger, what is the foundation? What's the essence? of what Geula is about, the big idea that everything else about Geula is always going to come back to. And of course, it's a time of no jealousy and no wars and no, um, and all goodness and no more tears of sorrow and everybody will be happy and there'll be an abundance of all good things and tasty things and treasures and all that. On a spiritual level, the, the central idea of Mashiach is a time when that the awareness of Hashem, the uh, attention to Hashem will be widespread, so widespread in the world, so prevalent, so pervasive, it will be as like water that covers the sea. And this theme um, is repeated over and over and over. We know even Galus Mitzrayim, the purpose of the Makais, Hashem said, why am I doing the Makas? So that Mitzrayim will know that I am Hashem. And if you're teaching Shemais, you'll see that this is, and you're teaching Parsha, this is the theme in every single Parsha. From the, from the moment Hashem speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu, it's so that you will know that I am Hashem. And, and after, Mitz, after we're done with Mitzrayim and we're in the Midbar, every time we complain, every time we quetch, there's a problem. Hashem says, I will do this so that you will know ki ani Hashem, that I am Hashem. And really, the entire Golas and our whole life's journey is about coming to discover Hashem. And the fulfillment of that journey will reach the climax of all history with Mashiach's complete revelation when, with the final ultimate Geula, when that will be that every single person, every single soul, every single blade of grass and every single inch of space within our hearts will know and demonstrate that Hashem is true. So the opposite of Geula is Galus. Galus is Hashem's hiddenness. Geula is Hashem's revealed presence. So if we want to teach Geula, if we want to make our classrooms a place where Geula is alive, what we really want to do is talk about Hashem and give kids a real connection with Hashem. There's... Um, there's a cute story 
about this guy who was, it's not really a story, it's a little anecdote, of a guy who was for bringing, meditating all night, in Oid Movadai, in Oid Movadai. There was nobody but Hashem. Hashem is the only one in charge. He's my only king. He's the only boss. Everything is Hashem. Hashem is everything. He will, in the morning, he must have been tired. He bumped into a wall. And he's like, there's no, ain't I bovada and this wall and this stupid wall, you know? Hashem is the only one in charge and this and this stupid wall. Meaning like a whole night, I'm for bringing about ain't um, I bovada, but when he bumped into the wall, it was the wall that bumped him. Hashem suddenly flew out the window. And I think this represents what Gullus is about. Hashem, we know Hashem, we love Hashem, we talk about Hashem, we, our whole lives, you know, as, 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 as keepers of halacha, our whole lives, every single minute of every single day is dictated by the truth of Hashem. And yet, when it comes to our challenges, when we bump into the walls of our lives, when we bump into those frustrations, the annoyances, the unsettling disappointments at times, all of a sudden there's nobody but Hashem and the wall, right? All of a sudden there's nobody but Hashem and, the pro- and, and this problem, nobody but Hashem, but my day is ruined because of that kid. Uh, there's nobody but Hashem and that parent, you know, because I'm 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 like a puppet in that parent's and we feel compelled to obey, and, and, and we feel like we have no choice but to be pulled along, and um, our, our our we lose our our power of choice, we lose our perspective because all of a sudden there's nobody but Hashem and da 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 da, da and you know fill in the blanks, and that's really. Um, and that's really the epitome of, that's really the, des- the definition of Gullus. And when the Altar Rebbe talks about being a Bainani in Tanya, when we talk about being a Bainani, a lot of us think of it as like, you know, that's something for like Halavaya Bainani, right? But really, you know, the Baal Tanya is talking about Baal Tanya, I'm so used to teaching in Barbara. The Altar Rebbe is talking to us, not Halavaya Bainani. Yeah, we could be a Bainani. Yeah, a Bainani never forgets that Hashem is true. Uh, a Bainani's behavior is fully aligned with Hashem. A Bainani is fully aware I am in this world, not by myself, with myself, self-sufficient, independent of Hashem, not the kind of person who says, you know, I remember once I was, I was in the hospital with one of my, uh, before one of my children were born and my daughter told her principal that her mother's in the hospital. So the principal said, oh, you mean like the kind of, she's in the hospital, like we should say tell him, or she's in the hospital, like we don't need to say tell him, you know, like, and it hit me in that moment. It also hit my daughter with such a force, like, what do you mean we don't have to say to him? Obviously, no, I didn't need the whole world worrying about me and saying to him out of a sense of fear and panic and anxiety. No, but is there a moment in my life when I don't need to him? Is there an inch of space? where I don't need Hashem. It's like that guy who's davening for a parking place. Like I was just davening for a parking place because I was running late and I didn't have a parking place. And then I'm like, oh, forget it Hashem. I found it on my own, you know? As he finishes his prayer, he promised it, I don't know, a hundred dollars to Hashem if he finds a parking space right away. As he's finished his prayer, a parking spot opens up and he says, no, 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 sorry. I found, it's okay, I got it on my own, right? By myself, with myself, for myself, I don't need Hashem in this, this I can manage on my own. That is the mentality of Gullus. That is a chametz stick of mentality. That is, that is ego. That is the imagined version of ourselves and the imagined version, the delusional version of reality, the Mitzrayim version of reality. And the truth is, we are here in this world by Hashem, with Hashem, and for Hashem. That's the that's the Pesach stick version. That's the Geula version. That's the matzah version. And that's really what we're, the whole Tanya teaches us to align ourselves with that mindset, with that perspective. And then from there, any, any disappointment, any frustration, any challenge that we have with one of our students, whether, or in our personal life, or in our school life, becomes an opportunity where like, oh, here I'm gonna make a dear bit of time. Here's where, gonna, where I'm gonna let Hashem make a difference. And in that difference is Geula. In that difference is the transformation. So let's get practical. How do we do this in a very um, in a very practical level? Because Adam, right? 
We want to see ourselves as if we are going out of Mitzrayim. We want to do the Geula thing, not just in theory, but in practice. How do we do that? First and foremost, by letting Hashem be real, by um, not telling any stories as if Hashem is not in the room. Somebody once um, shared with me a whole story about something that happened. Her mother-in-law was in, it's a Bar Park kind of story because in Bar Park, a mother-in-law is like the most intimidating person in the universe. She's like the one you have to be perfect for. And when her mother-in-law came to visit, she threw up and she was in the beginning of pregnancy. She was also in the beginning of her marriage and she threw up. And I said to her, what would it be like when you told the story to your husband, when you're telling the story to me, you, you told me that, you know, you, you had a day, you, you had an experience, you threw up. Did you, when you were telling the story to your husband, did you tell him that your mother-in-law was in the room when you threw up? She said, oh, of course I did. That's what made it so, dra that was the whole drama. That's what made it a story. <laughs> That's what made it so, so, so upsetting for me. I said, you know, a mother-in-law is just a person. When we tell ourselves the story about our day, do we tell the stories with Hashem in the room? When I'm running my classroom and I'm speaking to children, do I, do I speak as if Hashem is in the room? But let me go, I wanna read my notes because I actually am going, or I see myself going, or I'm getting a little bit lost. Um, that is so way, powerful. Just oh, as you talk, I wanna invite the participants if they have any questions. Um, oh, being that Mrs. Much, yeah. Ginsburg is our, yeah. our one can, and only speaker tonight. If anyone, we have time, we have till 9.15 when we have the breakout rooms, you can raise your hand, you can ask in the chat, you can speak up, we can definitely be interactive. Yeah, let's take, let's pause now for questions. And I wanted to wrap up with four little ideas, like practical things, but let's take time for questions or thoughts or a look at the chat. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, I just want to mention two interesting sikhas if nobody else has a question. Um, one of them is in the sikha of Chav Ches Nisan, when the Rebbe was talking so much about Mashiach, right? That famous sikha when the Rebbe said, Tut al Dvas Erkent. Right before the Rebbe said those words, Tut al Dvas Erkent, when the Rebbe was expressing such frustration that everything was for nothing because Mashiach didn't come. The last line over there, which I'm going to read, um, I, I, I found only the edited, my, the edited version. I emailed it to myself, one second. Um, right over there. Sorry. Oh, no. I'm sorry about that. It's, it's the edited version, which is in Hebrew. But the Rebbe says, right, everything that I did till now did not help. The Rebbe was screaming and Lai Hayel is bolded and highlighted in the, in the, in the edited version of Harayash and I'm dying the Gullahs. We're still in Gullahs. And more important, and more, and, and even, and the most important thing, the bottom line of like the worst thing is the Gullahs Pnimi Binyane Avaitis Hashem. We are in an internal state of Gullahs in terms of our Avedis Hashem. In other words, the, the most important thing the Rebbe wants from us is to achieve an inner state of Geula that each of us should experience a, a, that state of peace where we have the tools to deal with our jealousy. We have the tools to, to, to achieve a state of inner peace and to calm down those wars and to win the wars through peace. And, and we have the tools to Serve Hashem with simcha, to be aware and to really, really let Hashem make a difference. That's an internal, that's an internal state of Gua. There was another very, very fascinating sicha that I want to mention that is so, 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 so powerful. Gonna bring it up right here, which is amazing. It's Shabbos Parshas Vayakel, Chaf Hei Adar Aleph, also Tavshin and Aleph. This is the most recent edited, the most recent sicha that the Rebbe edited. And the Rebbe says the beginning of all Aveda, the beginning of all Aveda is, it's Chilas Aveda, and this is so beautiful as teachers, the beginning of all Aveda, who? He, 
שידע שהוא חד ממש עם עצמוס ומוהוס, that each of us should know that we are literally one with Hashem himself. שהרי הוא חלק אלוקה ממעל ממש. The beginning of all, you want to wake somebody up? You want, to get, you want to wake them out of their slumber, out of their tiredness, out of their state of gullus? The first thing they need to know is, and the first thing that we need to know is that we are actually one with Hashem. And to me, that is so, so, so inspiring, especially as a teacher. I'll tell you why. You know, there was somebody on the Tzayim, and um, he was doing, it was on Chalamayid Sukkis, and he was doing, he was um, giving his lulav and esrig to a person who was wearing jeans and long hair and didn't at all look like the, you know, the typical Jewish look. And a from looking man, obviously not Lubavitch, came over to this Lubavitch chassid and said, what are you doing? Why are you giving your lulav and esrig? Why are you even bothering with him? And the Lubavitcher looked at him and said, oh, you don't know? This is an anical, a ben achar ben of the Chofetz Chaim himself. It's a ben achar ben of the Chofetz Chaim. And the, and the firm guy is like, wow, Chofetz Chaim's grandson and you're helping him, what is chus? And the Lubavitcher looked at him and he said, you're such a fool. I hope he didn't say it in those words. He said, a ben achar ben of the, of the Chofetz Chaim is important. What about a ben achar ben of Avram Avinu, of Yitzchak Avinu, of Yaakov Avinu? What about a ben achar ben of, a Jew, of, of the Jewish people? And he kind of just put, put it in perspective. But the guy was not an eniko of the Chafetz Chaim. But he was just trying to say, like, this is a child of Hashem. And, you know, as a teacher, I know, sometimes we look at a child and we get stuck in their difficulties and in their obnoxious behavior and in their weaknesses. And in, their, in, in, in that moment, we, we can so easily lose ourselves and, and, and they test our patience and we kind, of, we, we kind of relate from the place of our own insecurity and our own fear of not being good enough. And when that happens, we, we get into a power struggle with children. It's like, oh my gosh, who's gonna be, I'm gonna put her in her place. What place? Who, what place are you putting her into? You know what I mean? What, what place? The only place that belongs to this child is they are chad mamish im atzma sumahus in the Rebbe's language. The edited sicha, the most recent edited sicha, that every child, each of us too. So don't be mean to yourself. If you make a mistake, be nice to yourself too, because you know who you are, one with atzma sumahus. Chelak alakami mamish, unbelievable. Sometimes we beat ourselves up. Oh, I made this mistake with my students. I did this with my students. I, you know what? We have to be nice to ourselves. And obviously we have to be nice to our students, but we also have to be compassionate, compassionate with ourselves. Imagine if the Rebbe would have children. Imagine if you were the teacher of the Rebbe's one and only child. What would that be like? Every one of our students are the Rebbe's children. They're Avram Avinu's children. They're Sarah Imenu's children. They're Hashem's children. And we got to always put that in perspective. So let me just come back to summarizing. The bottom line is everything that we teach our children, every unit, every lesson, every day has to be attached to the tree of life, to the life-giving roots. And that is a perspective of what life is about. And life is about Mashiach, life is about moving towards Geula. That's our mission statement. Let there be light is the mission statement of the world and the mission statement of every single day. Let there be light. Let there be Hashem's light. Let's demonstrate it. So let's talk about it, like make that connection. That's number one. Number two is every classroom, if it's your classroom, it's your special space that is designed for you to make into a geula reality. In this place, let Hashem be known and wanted. In this place, let Hashem make a difference to you and through you to the children, to how we speak, to how we guide the children, to how we think about ourselves, to how we think about the children with compassion, with love, with real, real respect for the atzmas and mahus. That's the truth of who we are. That's number two. Number three is to speak a geula language to the kids right? 
This is what I was talking about before. Like imagine if the Rebbe had a child in your class to really speak with love that the Rebbe would want, like to really be aware of, of that, of that connection. And, and the bottom line is, of all of this, I'm just gonna wrap up. It's really just to learn it, to live it, to be it, to show it, to include it. And, and, and with that, may we be zeichet to it today. I have another 10 minutes. Wow, I'm good. I, if you don't ask questions, I'm gonna feel like a fool, like a real failure. <laughs> that, that, how does that, that's like putting the pressure on, you know? We just that's wanna like hear making you. your questions about me. Why is it about me? <laughs> but you know what I mean? You know when you, when you, know, you know when you have a good a lesson when the students ask questions, right? When there's a conversation. Because otherwise it's like, okay, whatever, tune out. Yeah. Does anybody have um, anything that you want to share or, or bounce off or ask or? I mean, at the moment, it's very easy for me to say that it's all like very clear. It's usually like that when you hear someone speak very clearly, it's like, oh yeah, I got it. It's clear, you know, but then when we actually come to the classroom and we actually try to implement these things, then, you know, that's usually when the questions come up. But um, so far, I can just say that everything you've said, Mrs. Ginsburg, has really, really resonate, resonated with me. Um, and at the moment, like, I can't think of any specific question. I'm going to think now for the next couple minutes. But thank you so, so much for sharing all this with us. And I'm in the middle of reading your book, and I'm greatly appreciating it. And I know, like you said, the real work comes when you actually try to apply it. So that's coming soon. Marissa Shem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And you know what? What you just said is actually an answer. And it's a question, but it's also an answer. Like you're saying there's a challenge that that's where the work is. That's really so valuable. It's a lesson for all of us. Because, you know, I know for myself, it used to be, I would say, okay, you know, emuna and bitachan is very nice. But practically speaking, I need a dollar in my pocket. You know, or I used to say the joke, uh, a dollar in your pocket is a school for emuna and bitachan. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I would think about that as if it's like a normal thing to say. But what you're telling me is that, no, when you get into your classroom and you bump into a wall, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to maybe, maybe not in the moment, because in the moment, sometimes we don't think about it. But when you go home or whenever you have an opportunity to reflect back on the day and think, okay, how, how might have that applied? And with that awareness comes, the awareness is really the beginning of all change. So and, and slowing down and noticing where we're, where we're bumping into um, pushback, where we're bumping into resistance, that is, that's awareness. Because usually we just like take the resistance for granted, stress, misery, resentment, it's all for granted, it's part of life, you know? I'm gonna be frustrated at my kids, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak nastily, I'm gonna be obnoxious at times. Okay, it happens. But if we say, no, my place is a geula, this is a, happy space. This is a peaceful place. This is where Hashem's love is prevalent. This is where Hashem's love is revealed. Then when we meet those things, we're like, wait, what can I do about this? How can I shift a little bit? What, what, what new technique can I try to implement? What, what can I learn that will help make a difference? So thank you very much for sharing that. How do we deal with that, for example, with a student who is really in a deep, dark place? It's just about viewing them as one with Hashem. How do we do it? I'm not sure what the, what the question is. I, could I ask him? Could I ask? Yeah, sure. So like, what would be like uh, an example of an incident that you could deal in a Gaulistic way and then um, in a Gaulistic way? Like a re reframe of a kid who's really struggling. She's not happy, doesn't want to be in school, um, stuff like that. How would you, like, could you give an example? How we could... Okay, an interaction. Happen. So really, from, I mean, just off the bat, it would be, you know, if, if Geula is a place where Hashem is revealed, right? Um, and, and from that perspective of Geula, like and from the love and true, genuine respect for every child, maybe instead of trying to fit the child into school, maybe we could try to fit the school into the child. You know what I mean? In other words, maybe we can adjust the standards of expectation just to make it a little bit possible for her to achieve, to raise, to, to not, I'm not saying to completely lower expectations, but 
maybe this girl is going to shine in, in a different way. Maybe she's going to be appreciated for something other than her grades. You know, right, right. Um, it's going to have to have to happen with outside of, you know, has to happen one on one a conversation that tells her you matter. You're important. We need you here. You have an important part to you have something important to contribute to this class um, and to our school. And I need you and to me personally. And I need you. And you have to try to find a way to need her and give her an opportunity to shine. Give her a reason to, you know, when I was in, um, I think in eighth grade, one of my teachers wrote me a note. Um, you have beautiful midas, always keep them shining. And it made such an impression on me. It was so beautiful because I didn't see myself as that. And I respected her and it just meant so much to me. And I probably didn't believe her, you know, it probably, when, but but the fact that I still remember it till this day shows that it really made an impression on me. You never know what you're gonna say that's going to make a difference. Our job is to plant seeds and Hashem's job is to make them grow, but we just have to keep planting and keep planting and don't measure success by the results that you see. Measure success by doing the right thing and doing the right thing again and doing the right thing again because Sometimes, you know, Hazarim, Bedima, Bedima, Berina, sorry, those who right, plant with tears will reap with joy. Sometimes we really might not see those results in, a year, in the year that we're teaching this child. But for sure, you know, we have Chazaka, Latamula, Sha'ena, Chazaras, Rekam. We have a promise from the Alter Rebbe that no good deed goes unfulfilled. There's no effort that doesn't bear results. So our job is to measure success by how much we try, by how much we invest, by how much we give, um, and that's and, and not to look at the not to look at the results, but to keep giving and don't get frustrated by the fact that you don't see results because it took her however many years to get to that problematic state. It's not necessarily going to change overnight. I don't know if that helps, but thank you so much. Can I share a practical example of maneuvering uh, school expectations to a student? You tell me, like, it would have to Can be I share an example? Oh, please. I, I had a, thank you. I had a student last year who was way, way below grade level. Like, she totally didn't belong in the class, and the parents were oblivious, and she was just sitting in the classroom, and she felt like a non entity until Chaste Hashem. I realized that she draws. So I, so we really capitalized on that. You have an incredible gift from Hashem. And she would draw our Chumash lesson and we would hang it up on the wall. Wow. So after we would take a unit, she would draw it out. And actually we, we ended up putting it even in the school hallway because she, she really needed a lot of um, encouragement because she was really on, on like really... <laughs> Four, four levels down, she really didn't belong in the class. But that was one way we just tried to give her some sense of belonging and accomplishment. And, and the girls in the class really, you know, picked up on it and they really tried to make her feel good. And that was very special. But she did belong in the class. She didn't really, she shouldn't have been there, but she was there because that's where the parents, you know, sometimes it happens that. I, I really feel as a teacher, if a child is in your class, she belongs in the class. Like it's not for this year, maybe for next year, she needs to find a different school. But as long as when, when I think of a kid as she doesn't belong here, I'm cutting the umbilical cord. You know what I mean? I'm like cutting that. the branch off from the tree in my mind. So you made her belong. Maybe academically, right? she didn't fit, but she belonged there. How do I know she belonged there? Because <laughs> she is there. <laughs> The fact is she was there. So of course she belonged there because Hashem put her there. But for you, as a, I'm saying as a teacher and you made it work so beautifully. That's amazing. Thank you. That was a really nice example. How do we deal? Oh, someone said that. That was a question. How can we practic practically teach Yerash Shemayim? It's the same thing as teaching Mashiach. The same thing as anything you want to teach. How do you teach anything practically? 
You know, someone said, Emunah and Bitachet is not so practical. I'm like, yeah, right, because practical is from the word practice. It's as practical as we practice it, right? So Yerushimayim is the same thing. If we want to teach Yerushimayim, we, we want to talk about it, not from a place of fear, but from a place of awe. Like, we love Hashem so much. For me personally, I feel the biggest impact in my life is stories. I feel like Hasidish is stories, and this is a little bit off topic, Hannah, I hope it's okay, but um, Hasidish stories are the bread and butter. Sipurei Tzadikim is the bread and butter of Hasidish Achinach. I grew up on stories of Tzadikim. It gives, it opens your mind to a reality that's bigger than what you see. It opens your mind to Emunah and Betachin, for real, demonstrated. You know, every story is the same. There was a Yid in trouble, and Hashem made a nace, and Hashem, and he dove into Hashem. He went to the tzaddik. He did what the tzaddik said, and boom, everything was, every story was exactly the same. Same story, different place, different time, different names, always the same story, right? But it, it makes that story my story because I hear it again and again. So now when I'm in a challenge and I'm in a struggle and I'm in a pit, I know Hashem is going to help me and I have to figure out a way, you know, I have to talk to Hashem and daven to Hashem. So Hasidic stories, Sipurit Tzadikim, are really uh, one practical way of really teaching children here at Shemayim because it opens your mind to reality that's bigger than this classroom. Like invites, you know, to me it's like Hashem is, Oila means hiddenness. Hashem is here, but there's a curtain if you imagine like a whole stage, right? Um, and, and, and then there's a curtain concealing. Our job as teachers is to invite children behind that curtain to see Hashem. So the parsha comes alive, the Yamim Toivim come alive, Geula comes alive, we talk about it. And for that, we ourselves have to learn a lot. We have to, we have to be alive. We have to be connected to our roots so that whatever we teach, comes with that sense of aliveness. And, and um, it's never too late in our lives to really start doing Aveda Hashem on a real level. Every day when we walk into the classroom, we expect children to behave. We want them to sit up straight in their seats, follow directions, cooperate. We want a lot of the children and we want them to change. We want them to grow. We should never stop growing. We should never stop changing. We should never stop working on reaching for a state of Geula, definitely from a place of compassion. You know, the first thing is to know who we are, to know how precious we are, to know how beloved we are to Hashem, to the Rebbe, to the world, how much we matter, not, and to listen out for that voice of negativity in your mind that's telling you you're not good enough, you're failed, because you did this, you're even worse, you know? And to listen out for that voice of shame and indignity and all that negativity to, to stop it in its tracks, and really, the Cheo Bishteyadayim, turn your mind towards love and compassion for yourself and let that flow, let that flow to your students and um, let's keep working on it. And we should talk a bizecha to this way before this Pesach, go out of Mitzrayim. Hashem should take us out of our Mitzrayim. And then we'll come to, to Geula already having done the work of really being ready, feeling one with Hashem, feeling connected to Hashem, feeling like we really are in a place of umala aretz deyas Hashem because our classrooms are ready, they're all coming along with us, our hearts are ready.